Now, even though I've worked on a lot of mowers in the last decade, even I get surprised sometimes, and when it happens, it reminds me that I still have a lot to learn. This mower was very different from most of the mowers I've worked on, and after hours of work, it was running very well until it wasn't. And hopefully I can get it running again, otherwise I'll have to add it to my ever-growing lawn art collection. In today's video, we're going to be looking at this John Deere lawnmower, and the problem is that while it was running, it all of a sudden stopped, and I couldn't get it started again. Now, there are a couple of reasons for it to stop running all of a sudden, but most of the situations would mean something terrible just happened, which is not a good thing. Now, I'm going to try and repair this lawnmower, but yours might be different, so this might not work on yours. So if things are not working out for you, like in the video, please ask about it. I'll be glad to answer your questions. And for those of you who don't know the history on this mower, I'll quickly get you caught up. So this mower was a generous gift from a friend who happened to be working at the county dump that day and was given permission to take it home and save it. And when I was able to get my hands on it, turns out it was in running condition to begin with. However, it was in a state of neglect, never having been cleaned or serviced according to the owner's manual. So after doing hours of cleaning and servicing the wheels, casters, and doing some well-needed maintenance to the engine, we fired it back up for a test run, and during that run, it abruptly stopped running. Of course, I had to check and make sure that I didn't forget to add some oil to the engine because, let's face it, accidents do happen. However, it turns out there's more than enough oil in the engine, so that's not the problem here. Now the other possibility is that it simply ran out of fuel, but yet again, you can see there's plenty of gasoline in the fuel tank. Now a better reason why it would stop would be a gas cap that was not venting air like it should be. But as you can see, the plastic gasket that's supposed to be there under the cap is not missing, so that's not the cause of our problem either. Now at this point, I do want to try and start the mower and see if that might give us a clue as to what the problem is with it. So as you just saw, it didn't even try and do anything, which is not a good sign. Now to rule out that our problem is related to the fuel system, I'm going to add some fuel to the carb and then try starting it again. So this time it started and ran for a good bit of time on the gasoline I put into the carb. That means we won't need to use the compression tester because the engine starting and running tells us we have plenty of compression. And because it started and ran, it also means that we have plenty of spark from the ignition system, so we don't need to use a spark checker either. Now I do want to see if there might be a clog in the fuel line that's preventing fuel from leaving the tank, but as you can see, there is no issue with fuel flowing through either end of the fuel line. Although it doesn't happen all that often, there is a chance that the fuel line could collapse, causing a blockage. Next, I want to see if there might be something wrong with the fuel in the tank, however because of the way it's designed, I'll need to drain it from the bottom and not from the top. And from my first impressions, I'd say there wasn't anything wrong with the fuel. It still smells like gasoline, and even though it's a bit darker than I would like it to be, it should still burn just fine. Now since the gasoline, fuel line, and gas cap all seem to be in working condition, that pretty much leaves us with the carb as the likely problem. Shocking, I know. But we had to do all our testing to make sure that it wasn't something else that was causing our problem. Now on this particular style of carb, the bolts that hold the carb to the engine can be difficult to take off. So I would advise you to use something to help break them loose and also take your time otherwise you could break the heads off the bolts. And if that should happen to you, you might have to drill the bolts out or if you have them, try using a bolt extractor. Now I think the main reason why the bolts are tough to remove is because the threads are exposed to the elements and that could cause some corrosion on them. Now once the carb is off the engine, we want to be careful because we don't want to lose any of the fuel from inside the carb because we want to collect it and inspect it for any issues. And it's a good thing that we did because what came out of the car but doesn't look good at all and explains why the engine stopped. Now as you can see, there seems to be not only sediments in the gasoline but also water. And once you take a look in the bowl, you can see why it looks as bad as it does. So to be quite honest, I'm surprised that with the way it looks in here, the engine even started and ran at all. Now I do have plans on putting this carb into the ultrasonic cleaner, but unfortunately I need to clean as much of this dirt off the body of the carb first, otherwise I risk getting some inside the carb as well. Now while I was cleaning the exterior of the carb, I had to put the bowl back on, but after that we can now get a better look at it, and what we see here is terrible. Now because of how this looks, more than likely this is rust, which only makes sense because what came out of the car but also had some water in it, and this water is what caused the engine to stop in its tracks. 
and it looks like one of the Welsh plugs came loose and was sitting in the rust, so we'll have to clean that off and try to reinstall it as well. So here's the problem with using an ultrasonic cleaner. We have to clean any heavily soiled parts before we put them into the cleaner. And for those of you who need more convincing, you're going to see why here in a minute. Now, after getting the majority of the sediments out of the bowl and the rest of the carb, I'll then take the carb apart and put them into a jar of cleaning solution. Now, I've gotten a lot of complaints that I need to put the parts into the basin without a jar, but there's a reason why I'm using the jar. The reason why is because the solution in the jar is extremely flammable, so I cannot put the solution directly into the metal basin. So instead, I have to isolate it in the jar, that way I can reduce the chances for an accident. However, if my cleaning solution was water soluble, I would just put it into the basin as directed. Now, I didn't put the float into the solution for obvious reasons, so I'll have to clean it by hand, which is going to be a reoccurring theme on this carb. Now, it wasn't as bad as the rest of the carb, so this was a pretty simple task. However, once I inspected the parts after the first round of cleaning, you can already see the problem I was going to have. I'm going to turn the parts 90 degrees in the jar and then give it another round of cleaning and hopefully they'll look better after another round. Now while the ultrasonic cleaner is doing another round, I'll clean the other smaller parts by hand using compressed air and carb cleaner. So here's the reason why you need to clean the outside of the carb before you put it into the ultrasonic cleaner. It's going to loosen any of the extra dirt and then put it into suspension with the solution, which will then cover other parts that you may not want it to. That means all those tiny openings that you were wanting to try to get clean could get clogged with even more debris than before the cleaning. So for this part, I'm going to put it back into the ultrasonic cleaner directly into the basin with water to try to get rid of the debris. This is going to be a rinsing cycle with clean water and hopefully we didn't make the carb any worse. Now because this is not a regular cleaning cycle, I'm not going to give it a lot of time and we'll see if it looks any better. And by the way the water looks, it seems to have done a decent job of removing all that loose debris. However, if you take a closer look at the main body of the carb, you can see the loose debris is still there. That means we'll have to clean this carb by hand yet again. If I hadn't mentioned it this week, I think these cleaners do a good job, but they're not the cure-all and certainly not a replacement for physical cleaning. So after using some compressed air and carb cleaner, I was able to get rid of as much of the debris as I could. So I don't have a punch this size, which means I'll have to get creative when finding a way to get the plug to seat into the carb. The next part is reinstalling the needle and the float and then seeing if the float is sitting at a good position. The float needs to be as close to parallel with the edge of the carb as possible, and if not, it could mean we need to change the needle seat. Now this one is not parallel, but it's also on the very edge of being usable as well. However, from experience, and even though it's not perfect, it should still work, so I'm going to give it a chance. So what will happen if the float is not parallel then? Well, it could cause less gasoline to be delivered to the carb, and the engine will start to surge after a minute of running. The other possibility is that the carb might start to leak gasoline after some is put into the fuel tank. And if the carb should start to leak, I would have no issues with just replacing the carb instead of replacing the seat. But why would I replace the entire carb at the price of $15 instead of a needle seat for about $5? Well, the answer is success rate. Now, for some reason, my success rate for replacing a needle seat is less than 30%, while replacing a carb has a much higher rate at nearly 99%. So if you want to do the math or look at it from a logical point of view, for me, replacing the carb would yield a much better outcome in terms of time and effort. Of course, you're welcome to try and replace the needle seat instead, but don't be surprised if it doesn't work out in your favor. Now to prove that the old gasoline that I took out of the tank is still good, I'm going to carefully pour it back into the tank. Now, I will not be replacing the air filter because, as you can see, the pre-filter is almost spotless, and the same goes for the paper element as well. Now before I get the mower off the table, I also want to remove the blade and inspect its condition. So as you can see, it's in pretty good shape with only a couple of minor gouges in the edge, but as usual, it's very dull. But after using my grinder on the edge, it's now much sharper. So I'm just going to reinstall the blade, take the mower off the table, and then try starting it, and hopefully it'll work this time.
So as you just saw, it started rather easily this time. That means the water in the carb, along with the debris that was in it, definitely played a part in keeping this engine from starting. I will say that this has to be one of the most maneuverable lawnmowers I've ever used, but there is a major drawback. Now, even with the left front caster locked in position, there's a fair amount of play, which means keeping a straight line is really tough to do. Also, the hand controls are a bit difficult to get used to because it's not very intuitive. But over time, you should get used to it. However, in the meantime, you're going to struggle with it. Now, the caster lock is a great idea, but I'd like it to be a more positive lock or if we could lock up both casters instead of just the one. So hopefully whoever buys this mower will take good care of it, and if not, I'm always willing to lend a hand. So my question is, would you ever consider buying a mower like this one, or is it just too weird to get used to? Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions about this project or about your own projects, and I hope to see you in the next video.